Mike Williams loved to hunt, so when he went missing just before Christmas in 2000, it was investigated as an accident. Co-worker Brett Ketchum. We just assumed that there was an accident in the lake. Suspicions grew when no body was found. He was quickly declared dead. Life insurance policies were cashed in, and within five years, the widow and best friend married. Many years of sex, lies, and deceit. And that's how prosecutors summed up their opening argument in a nationally watched trial in Tallahassee. December 16th, 2000, Florida man Mike Williams disappears on a duck hunting trip. What happens next seems ripped from a TV soap opera. Can. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, urban legends, and every now and then a creepy place. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, plus early and ad free episodes, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K, media. And be sure to check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, merch store, mailing list, links to our socials, and of course, our Patreon. We also have a little virtual tip jar there, so if you want to help out our show, just swing by there and give us a little tip, and we'll give you a shout on the show. All right, so... Tonight's episode of paradise after dark so let's talk about it this um, is going to be part one of three yeah this is because the, 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 it does get kind of complicated yes this i tried to condense it as much as possible but it is so huge and there's just it spans over so many years and it's there's so much information and i'll explain more as we go but uh, you'll understand why we broke this up into three parts so we're going to be talking about mike williams Jerry Michael Williams, also known as Mike, he went missing in Tallahassee, Florida on December 16th, 2000. So, 2000, that's... 19 years ago. 20 years ago. Well, yeah, I guess 20. Mike Williams was born October 16th, 1969, and grew up in Bradfordville, Florida, just north of Tallahassee. His father was a Greyhound bus driver, and his mother had a small daycare run out of their double-wide trailer home. The family scraped by and saved money so both Mike and his brother Nick could attend North Florida Christian High School, a private Christian school in Tallahassee. One of Mike's favorite things to do growing up was duck hunt. After North Florida Christian, he attended Florida State University where he majored in political science and urban planning. At age 19, before he even graduated college, he was hired by Ketchum Appraisal Group as a property appraiser. He distinguished himself as the hardest working man I ever saw, according to the company's owner. In 1994, he married his high school sweetheart, Denise Merrill, and they had their first and only daughter in 1999. Mike was said to work 16 to 18 hour days at Ketchum Appraisal Group, often not returning home until after his wife and daughter had gone to bed, but he always made time for duck hunting. He would sometimes wake up and go hunting early in the morning before work. Two days before his disappearance, Mike and Denise told Mike's mother Cheryl Williams, as well as his brother Nick, that they were planning on having another child soon. Now, let's talk about the day that Mike disappeared. According to his wife Denise, on the morning of December 16, 2000, Mike got up early. He left the house well before dawn 
with his boat in tow and took off to go duck hunting at Lake Seminole. Now, Lake Seminole is a reservoir located in the southwest corner of Georgia along its border with Florida. It is known to be shallow with rough terrain of tree stumps and other hazards that our unexperienced boaters would run into. Usually it's easily navigated by the locals, and it's also infested with alligators, as most waterways in Florida are. Now, it should also be noted that this was also Mike and Denise's sixth wedding anniversary, and they had planned to celebrate that evening. Now, by noon that day, Mike had not returned. Denise called her father and asked him to go check the lake for Mike. She also called Brian Winchester, Mike's best friend since high school, and asked for his help. Winchester and his father drove up to the lake and found Mike's truck near the boat launch, but no Mike. Finally, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, also known as FWC, initiated a search and investigation. Later that day, a bad storm rolled in and they had to call off the search for the night. Because it was reported as a missing hunter, they were focused on search and rescue or recovery. Deputies with the Jackson County Sheriff's Office were present, but primarily worked in a support capacity. Now, they searched the lake by boat and helicopter and finally found Mike's boat in a cove not far from the ramp. Now, the cove, locally called Stump Field, was once an orchard before the Chattahoochee and the Flint Rivers and Spring Creek were dammed to create the lake. It is full of tree stumps that protruded above and below the water level, making it very difficult for boaters to navigate, as we mentioned earlier. But inside his boat was Mike's shotgun, still in its case, which is said to be his most prized possession. And missing from his boat, aside from Mike himself, was his waders and his jacket. Searchers thus assumed that Mike had hit a stump with his boat, fallen out, sunk into the water with his waders on. His waders then filled with water, and he was unable to get himself up out of the water, and he drowned. Well, yeah, because if you think about it, if you're wearing waders, so... Anyone who's not from Florida and doesn't or doesn't hunt and doesn't know exactly waders are like they're just well anybody anybody knows what hip waders are they're fishing I mean you walk out under water the idea is so you can be waist deep water without getting wet right but think like about if you were galosh. to fall in the water and those were to fill up well yeah it'd make it because it just turn you into a, a brick basically. yeah <laughs> so and you would sink well I mean it's like it's a good concept a thought and, and that'll play in that comes into play later but. Definitely. I mean, you would fill up with water and you couldn't swim up because obviously it's almost going to double your weight pretty much. Right. But if that were the case, then of course his his hip waders would have filled up with water. He would have been able to get himself up out of the water, back out of the boat, swim up, and he would have just sunk like a rock. And if this were the case, where's his body? So you would think that they would be able to find his body stuck in waders at the bottom of the well, investigators believe that Mike had drowned and his body would eventually surface. There had been many drownings in Lake Seminole over the years, and the body sometimes took a few days to rise to the top. But they always did. They always found them all, correct? Yes. They would need to wait until decomposition set in and the gases inside the body brought the body to the water surface. But when his body hadn't surfaced after a week, investigators told the family that due to cold temperatures in the water decomp may have been slowed and it might take a little longer however his body never did surface in lake seminole he was the only one in 80 known drownings in the lake where a body didn't surface right oh and one thing i want to clarify because it, it, it it's december and it's lake seminole and a lot of people say well, it was florida what do you mean water is cold if in you north, were in north florida, florida it gets cold i mean does. down here we are in south florida you you stay pretty good temperature wise. You do get some cold weather where you might get down in the thirties and forties, but that's not for long extended period of times. Not really enough to drop the water temperature to to frigid temperatures or cold. But when you get into Tallahassee, where you're close to Georgia, Alabama, it gets cold there. Mm-hmm. I mean, even along the Gulf, you're still cold because it, you're not in the South anymore. Really, I mean, yeah. you're kind of in that. You're pretty close to the, I don't want to say Midwest, but close to where you get a lot of the fronts come through. So, because I know when I was looking into this, I kept seeing that cold water and it got me to, I'm like, water ain't that cold? But then it occurred to me in Tallahassee, the water gets cold. Now, efforts continued until the search was called off in early February. Now, although the search was called off, the case was still considered open, of course. Nothing in investigative or search rescue efforts has produced any definitive evidence of a boating accident or a fatality as of this date. 
read the final report issued in late February of 2001 by the police department. At this point, the head of a private search firm, Montgomery County Search and Rescue, Inc., who is now out of business, suggested that Mike may have been eaten by an alligator. Investigators seemed to accept this theory as fact and pretty much abandoned the case. Now, Mike's wife, Denise, accepted that her husband was most likely dead and planned a memorial service for him to be held the day after the search ended. Now, in June of 2001, about six months after he disappeared, an angler in the Stumpfield area discovered a pair of waders floating in the lake and divers were called in to search the area, and then recovered a lightweight hunting jacket and a flashlight at the bottom of the lake. In one of the jacket's pockets, there was a hunting license with William's name and signature on it. However, there were no teeth marks or any other damage on the waders. None of the recovered items showed signs of having been in the water for anything like the period of time Williams had been missing. There was also no DNA evidence linking Mike to the items discovered in the lake. Now, this is one thing that I kept reading and it kept getting me is said they found the hip waders floating. Okay. Well, first of all, no, if you, we need to clarify that they were not hip waders. They were chest high waders. Well, okay. But his waders, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I'm as a fisherman. I always say hip waders. So I apologize because that's what fishermen usually wear, but chest high waders, it, it, they're like a big balloon. So, I mean, they just fill with water. Why would they be floating? You would think that they would just sink to the bottom. Right. So uh, that that's what I'm like. That doesn't make any sense to me. So anyway, moving along. A week later, Denise petitioned the court and was granted her petition to declare Mike legally dead based on those recovered items and an assumption that alligators and other water wildlife had consumed the body of Mike in its entirety. Now, she then collected on the $1.5 million life insurance policy. Mike's best friend, Brian Winchester, who sold life insurance for a living, had sold Denise this policy just a few months before Mike's disappearance. Okay, and just to clarify, because as soon as you say that kind of thing in, 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 in the true crime community, a lot of times you mention something about life insurance policies and she pulled the policy, you instantly think, oh, guilty. Just to clarify... Denise and Mike went and talked to Brian and got this policy together. So it wasn't like something she did on the sly Mm -hmm. and Mike wasn't aware of it. Mike was fully aware of the insurance policy. So Denise seemed to move on from the tragedy, even finding love again. Five years later, in 2005, she actually married Brian Winchester, Mike's best friend. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. Where two people who have a common interest, someone comes up missing. They do get together. That's not unrare. So all along, Mike's mother, Cheryl Williams, knew her son was not in that lake. She took a lot of criticism from the police and the community for her outspoken opinion, which was basically that Mike had been murdered and he was not in Lake Seminole. I like her. She even spoke to the top reptile expert at FSU and found that alligators do not feed in the winter and wouldn't consume a full-grown man without leaving a trace. So there is really no chance that Mike's remains were eaten by alligators. Alligators in North Florida typically don't feed at all between November and March when the temperature drops below 65 degrees. So Cheryl had three billboards put up around Tallahassee showing Mike's photo and asking for information. She even picketed around town and outside the church that Denise and Brian Winchester attended. But Denise and Brian told everyone she was crazy and to stay away from her. So she has gone to the, she's going to their church and around the community itself and accusing them of things. Not necessarily accusing them, but she was basically picketing with a big sign that says, who killed? Well, she she was doing it to them because she she at the time was suspicious. She she had her suspicion. Had correct? become suspicious. Yes, when they got married, she she did have her suspicions. Okay, well, I mean, as as a mother would. Mm-hmm. Now, three years after Mike's disappearance in two thousand and four, Cheryl finally convinced investigators to say, take a second look at the case. So she'd gone to them and got them to say, okay, okay, well, let, let's see what we can come up with, but. At first, nothing really came of that. In 2006, when investigators stopped returning her phone calls, Cheryl placed a newspaper ad 
asking for information, which caught the attention of a local reporter, Jennifer Portman, of the Democrat, I believe it was. The correct? Tallahassee Democrat, Tal- yep. Which we spoke about before. Now, Portman wrote extensively about the case for the Tallahassee Democrat, and she also appeared on Investigations Discovery Show, Disappeared, when they featured Mike's case in November of 2011. Now, in December of 2006, Portman wrote the first comprehensive report on Mike's disappearance, again for the Tallahassee Democrat. In the article was the first time police publicly acknowledged that Mike's disappearance was suspicious. Well, that's got to be a plus for her because, you know. Yeah. So now this is speculated to be because of Denise and Brian's marriage a year earlier. Because obviously that's going to bring up some red flags because now you've got money, you've got marriage, you've got the mother that's pushing stuff. So there's a lot of things that police have to look into, especially when they don't have a body. They really can't. Right. They have no way of saying whether it was accident or not. There's no proof as to what it was, but they do know that something happened. Something's not right. Exactly. Something's Something ha- fishy. They knew something happened to Mike. They just don't know what. They haven't put the pieces together yet. So Ronnie Austin, a former investigator with the Second Circuit State Attorney's Office, who was on the case, would later tell Portman in a 2015 article, My gut feeling is Mike did not die in Lake Seminole, which is the shared feeling of all law enforcement working this case. And I would love to say this is a suspicious missing person. Investigators seemed to start taking the case more seriously when Denise, Mike's widow, married Brian, Mike's best friend, as we spoke of earlier. But at the same time, FDLE, Florida Department of Law Enforcement, for those rookies out there, who was investigating the case, became more and more irritated with Cheryl Williams and her relentless campaign to find the truth. Which is understandable. I mean, okay, we get it. Stop. Because sometimes you're not really helping. But now in August of 2007, Lake Seminole was searched again, and this time with more sophisticated equipment. But again, they found nothing. So at the end of 2007, FDLE closed its case, convinced that the alligator theory was wrong, but without any leads or evidence that could allow it to further investigate. In February of 2008, insurance investigators decided to take a new look at this case. Although the statute of limitations for insurance fraud had expired, it can be extended if there are suspicious circumstances surrounding a death. The circumstances surrounding this case raise many serious and troubling questions. Mark Schlein, a senior attorney with the Division of Insurance Fraud, told the Tallahassee Democrat. It was also at this point that the FDLA finally started to consider this a case of foul play and stated that they had some person of interest but didn't name any names and declined to discuss any details on the agency's new outlook on the case. The Division of Insurance Fraud, Schleen told the paper, is interested in finding out exactly what happened to Mike Williams. If it turns out that we have an investigation of insurance fraud, it leads us to other crimes. We have jurisdiction to look into those too. We go where the evidence takes us. Right now we are searching for the truth. Kurt Perry from the FWC, who worked the scene early on in the investigation, stated that he wished he had known that there was an insurance policy and who wrote them. Maybe had they known this at the time, they would have looked at the case differently. Investigators at this point didn't believe that Mike drowned in the lake. Some even suggested that it was all staged and all the evidence they found was planted to make it look like Mike fell out of the boat and drowned. Which I think the total was like, what, $2 million almost between the policies? Because there were multiple policies. Right. It's like $2.2 million, I think. Mm. Almost $2 million? I'm not 100% sure on exactly how much. The number that I kept finding was $1.5 million. But there was a supplemental policy that he had originally. Yeah, I think there was a policy for 500000 and then there was a second policy, which was signed a few months before his death, that was for $1 million. Yeah. I could be wrong. Yeah, so, okay. But roughly a lot of money. Enough money to where, well, obviously people kill people for. Obviously the Division of Insurance Fraud is looking into it. Well, you get to certain numbers and insurance companies don't like to pay out. But the insurance investigators closed their case in December of 2008, stating that there just wasn't enough evidence to proceed with the investigation. In December 2008, Mark Schleen told the Tallahassee Democrat, 
If there is new information that comes to light, a case can be reopened. We have suspicions, but what we need is evidence. And at the same time, FDLE spokesman Mike Morrison said, there are leads that are being developed. We are optimistic that we will bring this case to a close. A little tip for people out there. If you do not have a life insurance policy, get one. And the reason is, if you have a life insurance policy, obviously it helps out and benefits family members who lose you. It helps them. The second benefit is it will help prolong the investigation and the insurance company will make sure to come in and investigate more. So that way, if you're missing or something's wrong, there's a chance that you have a second chance to get help. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. If there's a life insurance policy, the insurance company doesn't want to pay. They're going to investigate too. So now you have two people investigating, law enforcement and an insurance company. So tip of the week, insurance policy. I I have one, just saying. Okay, so in 2009, when Florida Governor Rick Scott took office, Cheryl Williams began writing him handwritten letters every day. She was asking Scott to assign her son's case to a special prosecutor investigator outside of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. She was at odds with the FDLE at this point, so she didn't want them to be involved. She's trying to get them out of the loop. Now, they were still annoyed with her, and she felt they weren't doing their job, which, you know, I mean, she made that perfectly clear. Now, the letters, approximately 240 of them... That's a lot of letters to the governor handwritten. ...were addressed directly to the governor at the Capitol office on South Monroe Street in Tallahassee. After receiving no reply, Cheryl found out that not a single one of her letters had even reached Governor Scott. The office of the Chief Inspector General informed her the letters have all been forwarded to the FDLE, the very agency from which she was seeking relief. They could not have hurt me more if they had punched me in the face, Cheryl Williams told Portman in a 2015 article. Now, As mentioned earlier, in 2011, Investigation Discovery ran an episode on their show Disappeared featuring Mike's case. This renewed public interest, but still didn't generate any new leads. Well, she was adamant about, she just stayed in there. I mean, she was adamant about, Basically, what I'm trying to say is she knew all along what's going on. She knew that something wasn't right. Right. So it's understandable. I mean, as a mother, if you don't have a definitive answer, the answer You're is... You're never going to stop. Exactly. Until something happens. I mean, we we know that. We've spoken to mothers. Yeah. So and people in general. And, we, and, and, and the stuff we've researched. It's You're not going to stop yeah, until you find out. Exactly. There's, there's no point at what you do until there's an answer. So... At this point, it was pretty much the consensus of investigators that Denise Williams and Brian Winchester knew more about Mike's disappearance than they were saying. So at this point, now the police maybe are a little suspicious. But neither of neither Brian nor Denise were talking. They were married now and were kind of united as one in a united front. So they're not going to speak. They're not going to talk. And all the authorities could do was sit back and just wait. And wait, they did. So after nearly seven years of marriage, Denise and Brian Winchester's marriage began to fall apart, and they separated in November of 2012. And in 2015, much to Brian's dismay, Denise filed for divorce. Reportedly, partially because Brian had a sex addiction. He was said to be visiting local prostitutes regularly. And Brian, well, Brian contested the divorce and grew frantic over losing Denise. So on August 5th of 2016, as Denise got into her SUV, she saw someone climb over the back seat. It was Brian, and he had a gun. He pushed the barrel of the gun into her ribs, grabbed her cell phone, and started yelling at her what routes to take. But instead of following his directions to an unknown location, she pulled into a CVS parking lot and parked in a spot close to the door. He told Denise that he had to do this because at this point, she blocked all his calls and texts, and he didn't want this divorce. He said he had nothing to live for, Denise told investigators, and got the gun so he could kill himself. Denise asked if today was the day the two of them died, the report said, and Brian stated, just me. After 45 minutes to an hour, Denise calmed him down, and she reportedly drove him back to his truck, parked at the Miccosukee Greenway at Edenfield Road. Before getting out of her SUV, he gathered from the back compartment a tan sheet and another sheet of plastic material, a spray bottle of bleach, and a tool. Hmm. 
Sounds to me like you had a kill kit. Yeah. Kill and hide a kit. Now, in petitions for domestic violence protection, Denise Winchester said she believed she and her 17-year-old daughter, who was 18 months old when her father, Mike Williams, went missing, would be in danger if Brian Winchester's let out of jail. Quote, I believe and know that Brian will kill me and or my child if he is released. Brian was held without bond on kidnapping and armed burglary charges following this arrest. According to a friend of the couple, Stephen Manukin said he went to lunch with Brian hours after the kidnapping incident. Manukin said a nervous Winchester told him the police were after him and kept contacting him, warning that once their divorce was final, his wife is going to say something about this guy who died 10, 12, 15 years ago. Yeah, so he is having lunch with his friend, and he said that once the divorce was final, his wife was going to say something about a guy who died 10 or 12 or 15 years ago. What do you think he's talking about? Well, obviously, he's talking about Mike. So Cheryl Williams hoped that with Brian behind bars, he may start talking about what really happened to Mike. He's not going to let Denise run around alone with all that money, she told the New York Daily News, referring to her son's life insurance, which was paid out in full to his then-wife. I'm praying he doesn't commit suicide. I'm praying he'll tell us what actually happened. Everybody in law enforcement says he's dead. Even his own brother says he's dead. I'm the only one who holds out hope that he's alive somewhere, she said. I want my story out, and I want everyone to know about it, because if he's alive... Somebody might know him. So she's still holding on to hope that Mike's alive after all these years. Now, we're talking 16 years at this point he's been missing. Yeah. So Cheryl noted that she hadn't seen her granddaughter in over a decade because Denise had barred her from visiting. So as soon as Cheryl became suspicious of Denise and Brian and started to be vocal about it, Denise started keeping Ansley, their daughter, away from Cheryl, her grandmother. Yeah, wasn't there at one point a comment made about uh, uh, Denise said to Cheryl that if she would just if she, stop all the investigation or stop your investigation, leave the investigation alone, that we'll let, you know, if you don't, we're not going to let you see your granddaughter? Yes. So Cheryl says, in a statement, Cheryl said, she was the only part of Michael's life I had left. If Michael's dead, I want them punished, she added, referring to Denise and Brian Winchester. I don't want them to get away with this. No parent would. So Denise and Brian's divorce became final on May 4th of 2017. Brian Winchester pleaded no contest to the kidnapping charges stemming from the August 5th, 2016 arrest. Now, Denise pleaded with the court to give Brian a life sentence, saying she feared for her life. He was waiting for me in the back of my car the gun. He grabbed the steering wheel. He shoved the gun in my ribcage, screaming profanities uncontrollably at me. I will never be the same. I would never wish this on anyone. I can't sleep. I can't eat because I only see him rising up out of the back of the car because all I feel is the gun shoved in my ribs. I can't have peace because I only hear his voice screaming and cussing at me. Please don't let him out. She obviously didn't want him to get away or get out. Mm-hmm. And But on December 19, 2017, Brian was sentenced to 20 years in prison with credit for time served and 15 years of probation with a GPS monitor to make sure he stays away from Denise. So he's going to get 20 years. He's going to get out in 20 and then 15 years of probation beyond that. Mm-hmm. Monitor probation, obviously, meaning GPS. Now, there was no mention made of the Williams case at Brian Winchester's sen- sentencing. Okay, so Brian Winchester's sentencing again was on December 19th of 2017. On December 20th, 2017, the FDLE made an announcement that they would be holding a special news conference about Mike Williams' disappearance. At this news conference, FDLE special agent in charge Mark Perez announced a breakthrough in the 17-year-old disappearance of Mike Williams. Standing here now, I can tell you what happened to Mike Williams, Perez said. He was murdered. And this point, FDLE has got a little egg on their face. That's right. And Cheryl Williams has a big smile on hers. 
That's where we're going to stop for part one. We're going to stop now? For part one, yes. Okay. Uh, join us for part two, and we're going to continue and talk about where how they got this information and where they went from there. And we've got some, we're going to be playing some audio clips, I think, uh, some extensive audio clip, which I think everyone's going to enjoy. Not necessarily enjoy, but it's going to be important to well, the case. I mean, enjoy meaning it's going to bring everything together. Yes. I don't mean enjoy as it's fun. I mean, it's going to sort of piece everything together and give you a full-fledged idea of exactly what's going on right now in this case. So that's it for part one of Mike Williams. Thanks for listening. Yeah, anyone, if you'd like to support our show, please check out our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Pomahawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And as mentioned at the beginning, check out our website for links to all of our social media, uh, merch store, and all kinds of other good fun stuff. And please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review us. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. We appreciate y'all's patience for our little break that we took, our summer vacation, if you will. And as always, we thank you very much for listening to Paradise After Dark. Duck, 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 duck.